Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Edward Simpson, and I'm the director of the SOAS South Asia Institute. Welcome to our annual lecture. Um, we have something of a hybrid event this evening. The format is going to be a lecture from Thomas Blom Hansen, followed by a Q&A, which will be um, chaired by Rochna Vajpai, colleague in the politics department. Please put Q&A into the chat as we go on. The South Asia Institute at SOAS represents a vibrant and diverse community of scholars and faces outwards from SOAS to the rest of the world with a particular focus on South Asia. Previous speakers in this series have included Ramachandra Guha and Wendy Doniger. It's my pleasure to welcome this evening Thomas Blom Hansen to the lectern. I've known Thomas for quite a long time now, and he's Reliance Dhirubhai Avani, Professor of Social Anthropology, founder of the Stanford South Asia Center, and author of numerous books, including the very well-known Saffron Wave and The Wages of Violence, which I was astonished to learn was published in 2001, so now has its 20th anniversary which surprised me because I still regularly recommend it to students as if it was somehow fresh off the bookshelf. The title of this evening's talk is The Violent Heart of Indian Politics, Reflections on Popular Sovereignty. So Thomas, welcome to SOAS, welcome to the South Asia Institute, and welcome to this rather hybrid format. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, and thank you for this kind invitation. I'm thrilled to be back in, in person, although the audience is small, but uh, dedicated. Uh, and uh, uh, so I'll see if I can navigate this sort of hybrid format. I will sit down so I can see my screen, and I hope uh, that will work for all of us. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about um, uh, Indian politics. Uh, and uh, at the end, I, I know that on the on the uh, some of the advertising, there was a mention also of academic freedom. Something I I have less uh, original things. I hope, uh, or I would say, to say up anything about. I think it's a good thing. We should keep it. But uh, I will say a little bit about how some of the logics that I'll describe in this lecture spill over into challenges that many experience when it comes to doing work on India at this time. All right. So let me begin. Uh, the story of India's democracy is often narrated as a miraculous birth of a democratic constitution against all odds and probabilities. From this moment of great promise, Indian democracy gradually changed from high-minded idealism and ambitious nation building in the Neruvian era to the present mass politic marred by pervasive corruption and cynicism and a more recent turn to violent majoritarianism. My recent book, The Law of Force, um, and I will uh, just share it here. Let me see. Here we go. Uh, the Law of Force, the Violent Heart of Indian Politics seeks to challenge, seeks to challenge this common storyline by pointing out two things. One, that violence has been of foundational importance in Indian politics and practical governance and policing for many, many decades. And secondly, that while Indian democracy has been very effective in making the moral force of majority rule a foundational value in public life, there's been less emphasis on translating the spirit and the values of the constitution into a foundation for the country's political life. So yes, it's true as many of our colleagues and many fine scholars have argued that the Indian constitution is a capacious and far-sighted doc far -sighted document has been able to creatively accommodate group rights uh, and has been appropriated by many groups in Indian society in their quest for inclusion and fuller citizenship, uh, giving the constitution a, a real social and political life of its own, albeit not as deep as we sometimes imagine. But it's also true that the democratic and procedural norms outlined in the constitution have only in part penetrated everyday political life and the way most Indians understand the essence of what politics is about. To many ordinary Indians, 
the world of politics is not necessarily always captured by the Sanskrit derived term Rajniti or the proper exercise of power term that today is widely used by BJP leaders as if reflecting what proper politics should be like and what a virtuous society uh, and dharma should look like as opposed to uh, niche Rajniti or dirty politics of or ordinary uh, politicking. However, the vernacular use of the English term politics and also politics cardinal or doing playing politics is a far more common uh, thing to me to encounter as Mukulika Banerjee has pointed out quite rightly in my view. So doing politics conveys a deeply or politics cardinal conveys a deeply realist and often cynical uh, ethos of desiring, holding, exercising political power, perhaps better captured by the Urdu term siyasat with the connotations of strategy and trickery. I think I take this to be a fairly indisputable social fact. So the question I want to ask in the rest uh, uh, address today is how has 70 years of democratic politics, activism and rambunctious electoral democracy in practice shaped and transformed the way in which political power and legitimate public authority are understood and transacted in India today? This is a huge question. I can only do a, a little bit, uh, but I want to talk about this sort of tension between a question of rights uh, and the question of violence. Now, over many decades, uh, it's interesting to note that over many decades, neither Congress nor the mainstream left parties deployed the promise of liberties and the rule of law as enshrined in the constitution as major public campaign themes. Many on the left were in fact outright skeptical of the, of the value of such negative bourgeois rights guaranteeing individual and collective freedoms in the constitution. They were seen as emblems of bourgeois ideology of liberal freedoms and had never really been prominent in the mainstream anti-colonial nationalism uh, during the freedom struggle. There, it was the language of the duty to resist that dominated. After independence, the powers of the state was turned into an instrument for reform and removal of social ills of all kinds. And many of these were projected not as negative rights, but as positive rights, social and economic development, education, social upliftment, and many of them appeared in the uh, often uh, not nowadays ignored directive principles of the constitution. In the decades to follow, centrist and left of center forces in India built themselves as defenders of India's sovereignty against uh, ubiquitous foreign hand or foreign interest as guarantors of social reform, modernity and development. And in everyday political discourse, it was progressivism or pragadivad emphasizing equality, reform, modernity that became the rallying point rather than the more contrived and rightist, if you like, notion of liberalism or Uttaravad understood as economic freedom and individual rights. The only exception to this general tendency was the activism in defense of civil rights that blossomed during and after Indira Gandhi's imposition of emergency. This was the first, we shouldn't forget, and only time in the history of independent India that the government turned its full force against members of the upper middle classes and the political elite, not all, but some. But if, as we also know, it was impoverished Muslims and other marginal communities that bore the real brunt of the violence and the reformist zeal of the desire to clean up India's cities, combat corruption and curtail what was seen as a runaway demographic growth among the poor. Both of India's most prominent civil rights organizations were founded during these years, the People's Union for Civil Liberties, founded in 1976 by J.P. Narayan, and the People's Union for Democratic Rights, founded in the year after 1977. So in addition to uh, uh, today, of course, and in the last uh, decades, a very vocal activist community, including feminists and LGBTQ groups and, uh, and so on, the, the only, I would argue, that, uh, and we can hopefully discuss this, that the only larger communities in India that today consistently appeal to the constitution and consistently advocate the rule of law and protection of human rights are the country's recognizable minorities, Dalits, tribal communities, Muslims, and communities in the Northeast of India. The protest in late uh, anti-CAA protest against the government's amendment of the Citizenship Act of 1955 made the constitution maybe for the first time really a highly visible and explicit rallying point for the protesters in places like Shaheen Bagh and many other places across the country. And 
today, one can say that some of those groups may appear akin to an Indian version of what Jürgen Habermas and other theorists of democracy have called constitutional patriotism. But I find that to be even that to be a problematic label, considering that each of these groupings emphasize and defend only particular aspects of the Constitution's provisions, such as secularism or freedom of religion or reservations. And few of these social political formations or communities can, to be, can be said to enthusiastically embrace the democratic spirit of the Constitution in their own community practices. And the question is, does anyone really? Um, And here is a, um, a, a slide that shows um, uh, a, the, the results of a, uh, a Pew Research poll that for, for where, whatever it's worth, and I, this is a very small number of people who've been polled, they're mainly urban, they're main, mainly educated, but it gives you some idea uh, of, of, uh, of some of the attitudes that, that one is not it's not hard to find those attitudes on uh, among people you will readily meet uh, in many parts of India. And so it's interesting that uh, the support for democracy in this Pew Research poll, which covered something like 47 different countries, um, uh, was one of the lowest in all of the world, the, the entire world. 75% um, thought uh, us whether thought that representative government in principle would, would be a good idea. And, and as you can see, 65% supported rule of experts, the highest of all countries polled, and more Indians supported autocratic rule by a strong leader than in any other country polled, including Russia and Turkey and so on. Uh, so that in itself is, is interesting. You can take it as a kind of, uh, for whatever it is, it's, it does, it's not a very deep uh, survey, of course, but it, it does indicate some uh, uh, common attitudes, at least in the urban middle classes. I was surprised by the fact that 53% of, uh, of those polled also thought the military would be, would be a good thing. Surely, that, I'm not sure that would be the same if you ask people in Pakistan, for instance. Um, how does one explain then what, what can only be called a kind of gen general diffidence about the constitution and its basic values in political discourse in India? And how does one to explain that a deepening democracy that indisputably has afforded previously excluded and denigrated groups a growing role in the electoral process and has been accompanied by a concomitant weakening at the, at the same time has been accompanied by this weakening of democratic norms, uh, such as respect for rights, equality, rule of law, and cultural difference. And I think the answer to that lies in the role that we sometimes ignore a much bigger role of violence than is often uh, being talked about. So let me go a little back uh, to some of the history uh, before I get into this. Um, as we know, when as British rule consolidated across the subcontinent in the 19th century, colonial officials found themselves in a constant state of worry about possible outbreaks of violence and discontent among the massively, massive and, and infinitely diverse populations they now rule. The, we know the East India Company's informers and intelligence, intelligence sources were tasked with keeping an eye on disobedient local rulers, as well as fakirs, mendicants, godmen of various stripes. We also know they failed to detect the resentments that eventually manifested uh, in the Great Rebellion of 1857 that shook empire globally. And now an earlier breezy confidence in British superiority gave way to new forms of governance and much more intensive policing. And the potential for popular violence was now regarded as a permanent threat to British rule. Not political violence, but popular violence. Um, this threat was countered by the gradual incorporation of na native elites into deli deliberative bodies, but, and this is my focus, combined with harsh uh, policing of streets, cities, and towns. The Indian Penal Code of 1860, still in force, introduced multiple sections, 18, that allowed the, uh, uh, in total, that allowed the authorities to use extensive force against any form of collective action deemed de detrimental or dangerous to public tranquility. Tranquility uh, in the public is still a kind of public, it's very important legal term, 
by the beginning of the, 19th, uh, the 20th century, riots and other disturbances were routinely attributed to the work still of irresponsible fanatics, blood marshes, criminals, and, and so on and so forth. In the eyes of the authorities, the growing urban populations across the subcontinent constituted an always unstable and volatile environment, prone to excitement and irrational passion. Police officers and observers began to refer to such popular sentiments as a cauldron or a karai, a large dangerous compound that had to be kept under control in order not to boil over. This constant possibility of an uncontrollable, even irrational popular violence was also fundamental to anti-colonial thought and political action. We know, for instance, Tilak states Hindu festivals such as the Ganpati Utsav in the 1890s as a new physical mass politics and mass manifestation that both wanted to counter and emulate the mass spectacles of the Muslim Muharram, for instance, while always at the brink of the threat of mass violence, violence that sometimes actually happened in Bombay in the 1890s. Gandhi encouraged and led mass action while constantly seeking to control its potential for violence. And as been pointed out by Faisal Devji, Gandhi's thought and action revolved around what he calls the temptation of violence and the recognition of violence as a form of irreducible truth of politics and of popular sovereignty. The moral authority and potency of nonviolent action rested precisely on this supposed capacity to control and keep in check the potential of a much larger, much more catastrophic form of violence where communities would set upon each other and ignite an endless cycle of anger and vengeance. In this perspective, partition was not a catastrophic aberration but rather the eruption of this ghastly truth, if you like, of political life and its attendant political and social consequences into public violence on an almost unimaginable scale. In her new, just published, and I find deeply original book, Violent Fraternity, Global Political Thought in an Indian Age, Sruti Kapila proposes to see the partition and not the constitution uh, as a form uh, as, as a foundational to Indian political life in several ways, although she also talks about the constitution. Partition was a culmination of a form of politics built on what she calls fraternal antagonism between Hindus and Muslims that began with Tilak Savarkar and the RSS and so on. It also instituted a logic of enmity that enabled Hindus to create political unity that promised to overcome the deep social antagonisms of a caste, of caste and untouchability antagonisms that in Ambedkar's view, as we know, would forever prevent Hindus from forming a proper society. Now, in the decades that followed independence, co these colonial ideas of riots and disturbances of public tranquility being caused by fanatics and criminal elements were supplemented by the category of the antisocial uh, uh, activist, the antisocial element, those who would cause division and discord by unnecessarily stir the cauldron of public sentiment and unleash mass violence or disturbances. When, when emergency rule was imposed in 1975 by Indira Gandhi, it actually happened in the name of ensuring public order and protecting national sovereignty and protecting public order from the JP movement that was very active across North India at the time, uh, but also supposedly, supposedly protecting the state and national sovereignty against a threat of mass violence from within and the dreaded foreign hand that was always invoked during those years. And let's also not forget that the first iteration of the UAPA, the law, the uh, Unlawful Activities uh, um, um, Act was passed in 1967 and was used for, to target both insurgencies and civil disturbances ever since. Today, it's been used much more widely than ever before. So let's fast forward to the, to the uh, period we're in now from the late 1980s, where Indian politics enters a much more uh, intensive phase marked by transformative mobilization of lower caste communities, claiming visibility and presence in the public domain, the emergence of powerful regional movements, and of course, the rapid growth of the Hindu nationalist movement around the demand of the liberation of uh, Ram's alleged birthplace in Ayodhya. Now, this, we all know, resulted in a dramatic escalation of communal violence, now mainly as attacks on Hindus or on Muslims by Hindu militants. These developments were also accompanied by a whole new slew of forms of protest, assemblies, 
demands and indeed incidents of public violence that escalated from the 1980s to continuously high levels in the 1990s and into the 2000s. Reported caste violence also escalated in these decades as upper caste and dominant caste communities retaliated against what they saw as lower caste arrogance and political assertiveness. So this hyper-politicization was magnified by a couple of other factors as well. Firstly, the electoral and the legislative process in India today separated in a way that's unknown in other major democracies. Because of the complex legacy of a nervous colonial bureaucracy, it's suspicious of a subject population. And the Nehruvian state turned into a highly centralized and command-driven technocratic bureaucracy. And the vast majority of policymaking and implementation uh, is completely separated from the electoral process. The vast majority of elected politicians neither make laws nor drive specific legal reforms. Conversely, most public officials across India see elected politicians as a constant, constant threat to their ability to implement laws and policies. And the net result of this alienation of, elect of electoral politics from lawmaking is that the domain of public contestation is dominated by emotional and ideological issues, symbolic gestures, concerned with collective dignity, protests, commemorations, martyrdom, etc. The other thing is that public violence and the performance of anger and outrage has become ever more accepted languages of political life in India. While Indian society remains deeply hierarchical in terms of deference to social status and wealth, Decades of dynamic electoral politics have actually uh, established popular sovereignty as a dominant idea. Only those who can win the hearts and support of the majority will be and should be able to rule and manage the expectations, the anger, and the potential of, for violence of this majority. And public violence has therefore changed from a earlier protest mode into a couple of new modalities. One is what I would call a performative demonstration of anger, disaffection, and community strength as an increasingly legitimate language of political expression. And secondly, a kind of what I would call a transactional modality, if you like, where disturbance of political order, loss of life, and loss of governmental control, or the threat thereof, can be mobilized in support of certain demands made on authorities and dominant communities. And thirdly, a punitive modality where mostly dominant communities, kin groups or factions set out to exact revenge and violent punishment for perceived insults to their honor, property, uh, or perceived entitlements. So how do we think about sovereignty and popular sovereignty? And, and the, the problem is here, I think a lot of the, the, the work that has been done in this field uh, uh, attach itself very much to questions of state and nations and laws and legality. And um, instead, I, I go back to uh, a figure that definitely is uh, inspiration for much anti-colonial nationalism, as well as for mainstream uh, political ideas in, in most of the world, and that is uh, uh, Jean-Jacques Rousseau. In the social contract, he launched a distinction between sovereignty and government that were to become foundational in most modern democracies. And it's here on the screen for you to read those two little excerpts. Sovereignty, Rousseau argued, is indivisible and expressed in the general will, a force residing in the people as such, a force both constitutive of all power and inalienable, that is, it cannot be given or granted to anyone else, least of all, of course, a monarch or a dictator. By contrast, the government is merely an executive, kind of executive function uh, serving to administer and maintain liberty and order uh, and to secure correspondence between subjects and the sovereign. Rousseau concedes that the actual sovereign and its general will always elusive, always evoked, interpreted through consultation, assembly, and possibly a majority vote, maybe even a plebiscite, as he also recommends in this book. Yet, he argues, the force of sovereignty has to be present. It has to be an omnipresent constituent power that enables and empowers all legitimate government. Its main function is to be what uh, uh, political philosopher Richard Tuck in a recent book has called a sleeping sovereign, 
a presupposition that's always there, but has to be asleep. Now, Rousseau's distinction between sovereign, the, between the sovereign people and the government corresponds, or, the, or between sovereignty and government, corresponds well with, uh, in many ways, with the distinction between Raj and Sarkar in India, with Sarkar being, a, uh, the hands of the head being a more precise expression of Rousseau's understanding of government even than the English term, and the Hindi term Raj corresponding with Rousseau's notion in some ways of the sovereign as the underlying source of power, the underlying reality of rule. The we, the people of India, the preamble to the Indian constitution invokes precisely this, the people as the constituent power of modern India, a sleeping sovereign ideally only to be awakened during elections. Now, Rousseau recognized that while the general will requires careful legislation by enlightened men, the actually existing people might well be a problem that can be corrupted and, as he calls it, deceived. And this warning against the actions of a deceived or misled people would have resonated all too well with many of the framers of the Indian constitution, uh, uh, with uh, uh, this process happening a few years after the mass violence of partition. To come back to Shruti Kapila's works, he argues or urges us to consider partition and the violence that followed across the subcontinent in the first years of Indian independence, not as an aberration, but instead the constitutive and violent moment where the general will of the Indian nation was defined. If, the fish, if partition with all its moral ambivalence and horror was the violent truth of the birth of the nation that follows, that India's sleeping sovereign, if we go by this, terminology, the people is an equally dangerous and morally ambivalent force. With independence and democracy, that dreaded cauldron of public anger had to be managed, but also taken seriously in new ways. And it was precisely this fear of violence and manipulation that motivated the formation of the Election Commission of India, one of the most empowered and autonomous of its kind anywhere in the world, capable of disqualifying and excluding candidates and the envy of many other countries. In fact, I would love to have an election commission in the US, for instance, um, no chance. Anyway, after the end of the emergency, um, uh, the, the now famous model code of conduct was instituted in order to curb, uh, institute even stricter limitations on sp the speech and conduct during elections. In a landmark case in 1995, the Supreme Court of India barred Shiv Sena leader Bal Thakare from electoral campaigning and found him guilty, guilty of spreading communal enmity which is uh, the strict rules about this during election times. The judges admonished Thakare and reminded him that, and I quote, leaders must be more circumspect and careful in the language they use for, ma for maintaining decency and propriety and for the preservation of the proper and time honored values forming part of our heritage. Now we know that such strictures in public speech during election campaigns have not prevented the proliferation of many forms of hate speech in India despite these rather stringent provisions also, for instance, in section 295A of the Indian Penal Code that bans deliberate and malicious outraging of communities and insults to religious beliefs of a class of people as the, the section reads. In the early 90s, a young magistrate in Pune expanded on this problem to me in the following way, which I find interesting. He said, look, many I asked him, why is it impossible to, to control or curtail the proliferation of hate speech that was going on at that time? And he said, well, many of these people say that they, they just talk straight from their heart. How can we prove that to be a malicious thing or even a crime? It's only during election time can we say that whatever people say or do are done with one intention, and that is to win votes. This is why we have all these cases only during election time. Now, with the rise and, uh, of, of lower caste politics on a grand scale, the idea of mobilizing or representing majorities, the Bahujan in states and elected bodies as caste coalitions, as religious communities became a, a much more powerful idea. You can say a permutation of the sleeping sovereign, a true majority that could be awakened indeed. This notion of the majority itself, the Bahumat, began to acquire a stronger, effective, and moral force. 
the moral force of, ma of a majority, whether defined as a pre-given cultural entity or understood as an electoral proof of the superior force and truth represented by a political party or a leader, uh, and this is indeed a very common um, uh, perception uh, in India today, emer emerged in no small measure from regional politics across India. The linguistic movements across much of India in the 1950s and 60s had mobilized powerful sentiments on the assumption of an inherent superiority and naturalness of a polity based on linguistic affinities of a majority. Majority was the basis of the linguistic reorganization. They had also demonstrated the political potential of mobilizing emotional bonds around language and a generalized rhetoric of cultural intimacy and relatedness. And prior to the rise of Hindutva, most of the morally charged rhetoric of sacrifice, treason, of emotional outrage and attachment, often accompanied by physical attacks on newspapers, public figures, institutions, emerged in states such as Tamil Nadu and Maharashtra, where strong linguistic and regional politics dominate political life. And to come back to our friend Bal Thakere, more than any other formation, it was Shiv Sena that framed this new politics of direct and violent action. From the 1980s to the, to the 2000s, Shiv Sena also called, for instance, for bonds on a regular basis, sometimes to achieve particular goals, but often to demonstrate its ability, just demonstrate that it could shut down the city if it wanted to, and the state. The power of the bond rides not on actual violence, but only of the latent threat of it. The effectiveness of these bonds said less about active support for the Shiv Sena or any other state, any other party that may call it, and more about its claim to command the control of public space and the control of the source of public violence. And to come back to my terminology here, Shiv Sena's innovation was to permanently weaponize the sleeping sovereign, as it were. Shiv Sena claimed that the movement and its leaders were able to interpret and express popular anger to control and project this latent anger as mass violence, but also to curb and transform this force into real political power when needed. In this way, Shiv Sena became at its peak something like an omnipresent and shadowy power that everybody had to reckon with one way or the other. And that proved to be an almost irresistible formula for popular politics and political entrepreneurs and aspiring political bosses across India, as has been demonstrated by many scholars and observers in recent years. If you don't know the book by Lucia Michaluti and others called Mafia Raj, it's a good example of, of many uh, bosses of this kind. In some of my earlier work, I've, I've called this kind of violence and this form of power uh, a de facto sovereignty because it's based on the ability to kill and to discipline with near impunity or total impunity. And this is possible in a place like India because the sovereignty of the state is far from a settled question, not just in regions and communities that openly contest the presence of the Indian army and security forces, but also in all kinds of other ways, such as open defiance of the public order laws in streets, the street protests, in matters of community and family customs, in matters of exacting punishment of the enemies of families and communities, and the list can go on into many mundane practices. I'm not saying that India is a weak state like uh, a terminology I, I always found dissatisfactory or unsatisfactory, but rather that it's a porous state and it's uh, uneven, and therefore this, uh, there is all this room for these forms of contestation. Opposing and defying the law can easily be con constructed as a, and mostly is constructed as a defense of the nation or the true people, the true popular sovereignty of the community or the majority. As we also saw in the US in the attacks on Congress in January in, uh, 2001, this year, or even in the farmers protest that just has been concluded successfully in India where one saw the return at times of the old 1980s slogan, the, the, the true rural Bharat versus the not so uh, authentic India, urban India. And for some scholars, this distinction between Raj understood, understood as sovereignty of the realm and Sakar uh, suggests a deeper conceptual gulf between notions of just rule and actual government, a gulf that may indicate a continuing legitimacy of what some people call kingly forms of sovereignty and legitimacy. Others, correctly in my view, 
argue that what Richard Burkhardt many years ago uh, aptly termed the lordly style of South Asian politics and public life need not refer to any legitimacy of actual aristocrats or kings. Rather, today's political bosses and notables in India are fully aware that their power and legitimacy depends entirely on their ability to embody and express the aspirations and style of the communities and kin networks they command. As Lucia Michelutti has suggested, the dominant style of popular politics in North India is what she calls kingship without kings, based on metaphors of kinship projected onto what she also calls divine kinship. So this leads me to a, a few other reflections, and I'll uh, show you some more slides in a moment, um, uh, of on what is, how should we think about popular sovereignty? Because it's, of course, a lot more than just a capacity for violence. What is it? What more is it? So while governments and states constantly try to project sovereign power onto territories and populations, popular sovereignty is not really a legal concept, but is an ideal, an aspiration, a horizon, something that can never be fully achieved. In his work on popular sovereignty in America, Edmund Morgan many years ago rephrased Ernst Kantorowicz's classic idea of the king's two bodies to be the, pe the people's two bodies, one actual and flawed, the other permanent and pure. And as Claude Lefort also put it several decades ago, the idea of the people is always an empty place, maybe even an empty substance that can never be fully represented and indeed always present, is always present, uh, but under and misrepresented most of the time. This is foundational for democracy. This means that the popular sovereignty or the idea of belonging to a self-governing community and state is also a powerful emotional force a powerful promise of fulfillment and inclusion. It can be experienced in a crowd or political rally. It's strongly internalized among, uh, let's say, the Gaurak shows in India or the armed volun volunteers, militia, volunteer militiamen in the US who, uh, who hunt down illegal aliens along the border. And it can motivate voters who project the, their aspirations onto a leader who promises to make their country respected in the world. That happens not just in India. So the, nation, the Hindu nationalist project crucially revolves around, I would argue, awakening the sleeping sovereign and creating a permanent sense of, of national mobilization and alertness. The tall flagpoles across India, the celebration of the army and the surgical strikes, and even the attempts to have everyone stand in, in cinema halls for precisely the 52 seconds it takes to sing the national anthem, although that order was, was revoked. Uh, in, uh, but it also includes attacking and trawling traitors, perceived enemies. These are all measures to kindle and awaken the live and effervescent experience of being part of a sovereign people. And mind you, this is an angry and anxious people permanently at war with its enemies. Anyone who publishes a book in India today will have to contend with a, law, a lawyer perusing the manuscript so as to identify passages that need verification or softening so as not to provoke public anger or hurt public or religious sentiments. The unstated but very real implication is, of course, that a publisher, an institution, or an author, academic, or artist may risk attacks and vandalization of their promises and home uh, and face threats to their personal safety. It happened to a very prominent former minister just last week. Uh, I went through the same process with this book. Uh, which was somewhat ironic, considering that my book is exactly about how these threats became so commonplace that I had to go through this process, right? Um, anyway, so let, let me end on this last section is, is about uh, more about um, uh, some other uh, uh, dimension of what violence is and does. And my argument, one observation I'd like to share is that as much as, as India has been, in a sense, one of the most important places for the study and, and thinking about and conceptualizing collective violence in the world, uh, it's also this focus on especially communal riots between Hindus and Muslims or against Muslims now uh, has, in a sense, blinded us uh, to the fact that there are so, um, uh, there are, there, that public violence is a much more commonly um, uh, it's a much more common and much more widespread phenomenon than just these particular riots. Take a look at this. Uh, 
this, uh, in, since the 1990s, the number of officially reported riots in India, that is, and these figures are all available now uh, and online, uh, and not so many people have looked at them, but it's well worth doing. I should say that, uh, keep in mind when you look at these, that just keep in mind how much work any police department will do not to register something as a riot, right? Because having a riot in your precinct is not good news for a station commander or for a police commissioner and so on. So keep this in mind. These are, and these are probably also heavily edited uh, uh, numbers. But you can see that the collective, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the numbers are, are, are pretty high in, in, in during just after emergency. And then again, uh, uh, in, in the nineties, then they fall uh, gradually. And then they have sort of stabilized in the last decade and a half at around uh, 75,000, 71, uh, whatever. Now, only a few percent of these total riots are registered as communal. Again, a category that's more severe and will also uh, risk uh, transfer or other kinds of sanctions on police departments that uh, see this on their watch. But what is really striking here that I wanna share with you is that the vast majority are actually not, it's neither political, uh, uh, it's not communal, it's not student, it's not whatever. It is what you could call normal violence. That is a normal way of transacting and interacting with each other as well as with the state. And these are non-trivial numbers, even in a, in a large society like India. Um, and so, so what are these? And actually we don't know. We don't know because many people like myself who have taken interest in this have actually not done any kind of systematic study of how these other kinds of riots actually take place, which is a dominant form according, and this is, a, this is probably something of an understatement, right? These figures are, are most reported figures as we know in India is um, are underreported. Now, this raises the question, why is it that this has become like this? Why, why, why these very high levels of violence? It doesn't have to be like that. And the few figures we have, however reliable they are back from the 60s and 70s show this decidedly lower numbers, right? So it didn't have to be like this. Uh, it's not endemic to, uh, uh, to uh, uh, Indian society. Why is it? Now, the, the normal, and this, I'll end with these um, reflections on this, um, that the normal, we know the normal explanations, this is a political strategy of instrumentalizing violence to uh, seek uh, office or to, to, to seek certain forms of gains. Uh, these are gangsters and criminals doing it and so on and so forth. But actually, I um, uh, don't think that's very uh, believable uh, only. That's not everything that's going on. And for one, there are a couple of reasons. One is what I'm trying to um, uh, show here, again, based on official numbers, which is interesting, um, that when you look at um, some of the number of individuals, I'm just taking uh, a few years here, 16, uh, 14 to 16, uh, people were charged under the sections IPC um, uh, 153 and 153B, incitement of enmity between groups, which is the communal uh, this is what you're charged with if there's a communal riot, right? Um, there was only, although the police say, oh, we have a 16% conviction rate in all riot cases. Actually, when you drill down the numbers, the reported numbers, and you would think that this would be overreported, there's only 13 cases that led to conviction, which is, uh, let's call it a trivial number, um, right? And, um, and you can also see here the very, very large number of, pieces of, of people who are arrested and charged and, and, uh, and, and there's an enormously high pendency, even, even by Indian standards, even by the standards of the Indian court. Uh, this is, what, what, can you, what can you draw from this? This conclusion that I heard many people I have talked to and spoken to and hung out with over the years, that doing this kind of, uh, uh, having a bit of fun in the street, as it were, or staging or whatever attack on other people is almost risk-free, but it depends. It depends which community you belong to. I'm happy to say more about that because uh, both, especially Muslims and Dalits are 
are persecuted and punished much more harshly also when it happens. So most of the punishment for riots do not happen after, but actually during the time of the suppression of the riot, and that's highly differentiated. So um, the final section, I'll just say a little bit about uh, uh, a, a third explanation you can, you can uh, uh, think about. And that is that uh, violence and public violence is uh, also a screen for um, enjoyment and for uh, an experience of some kind of fulfillment and even freedom. Now, the protesters and vigilantes who today stage attacks on opponent institutions and individual traders describe their actions always and the, as the inevitable effect of pent up anger and uncontrollable outrage, as if the scale of physical destruction is an index of the depth and intensity of their rage, right? And, uh, protesters almost mirror the language of the law, such as Article 295A, when they blame the offenders for provoking their own anger. Vigilante groups in Karnataka or Maharashtra blame the conduct of immoral youth for the anger that wells up in themselves, the vigilantes. The violence is felt like a natural urge to protect Hindu values when provoked and leads vigilantes to beat up and molest uh, middle-class youth at private house parties, for instance, not uncommon occurrence. In a similar vein, the activists who attack contemporary art exhibition spaces. Artists or writers or academics blame the artists or the writers for their attacks. In their view, immoral art and other expressions are offensive to Indian culture. And the activists claim that they simply cannot control their own pride and anger. They must seek and destroy. The protesters or the vigilantes want the government and various publics to take note, but the audience is not always a general public. It can often be a more regional or segmented or particular uh, audience. Uh, in these public actions, uh, even excessive and cruel violence can be purified, made just and moral by the imputed injury to the community or collective emotion that provoked it in the first place. Violence is portrayed as purely reactive, spontaneous, and therefore inherently just. It is, like a Shiv Sena activist in Mumbai put it to me many years ago, something like a force that's inherent in any brave and self-respecting man. If someone slaps me, he told me, my hands come out and I slap him. It's natural nyaya, it's natural justice. It's as if the violent act has autonomous force, pure reaction without culpability or moral responsibility. So in that light, what we see going on now, I want to suggest uh, across India, is perhaps not so much so, such an aberration from much earlier and longer uh, patterns of much longer standing. But it, it begs the final question I'll just consider briefly. Why, why do so many ordinary people in India seem to tacitly endorse or even actively participate in public violence? Now, many common sense perceptions and some scholars too attribute public violence to the work of young, frustrated or deprived men for whom destruction, noise, inflicting physical harm is a form of compensation for their own weakness and marginality in everyday life. There may be some truth in this sometimes, but the best studies of violence, and it's mostly male perpetrators, have decidedly demonstrated that perpetrators of extreme violence are rarely very marginalized or very deprived. Rather, perpetrators are aspirational, frustrated, but also drawn to the experience of power, fraternity, and freedom when engaging in violence and violent organization. These are precisely the experiences that doing politics may offer. The sense of being involved in something bigger than yourself, of being protected, acting with impunity, the enjoyment of the strange suspension of norms during riots and collective protests, or the strange suspense of, of elections where power is hanging in the air, or the voyeuristic pleasure of the bystanders to violence who often like to cheer on our boys. So my proposition here is that that legitimacy of the legitimacy of public violence is directly connected with aspiration and experience of empowerment. In 2017, a very in interesting book came out uh, published by a American uh, sociologist, Francesco Duina. It's about America. It's called Broke and patriotic, why poor Americans love their country. Here he shows in compelling detail that American citizen, citizenship itself gives the poorest uh, in America an experience of power and freedom despite their marginality. 
he interviews an elderly man and vet, a veteran living in a mobile home in one of America's poorest states. And he says, I don't have much, but at least I know that I live in the strongest and the richest country in the world. And it seems to me that a somewhat similar logic may be at work in at least in part in contemporary India. I think it's a, precisely this promise of inclusion into an empowered majority, the fleeting sense of freedom within a crowd, and also the sense of having been given permission by one's leaders to act, hit, or abuse that are very powerful ingredients in public violence today. These ingredients are most, most uh, clearly articulated in the projection of an injured majority uh, against its many enemies. And here's what Amit Shah said in 2014 when campaigning uh, uh, after the deadly attacks on Muslim communities in Musafanagar in Uttar Pradesh. He said in a meeting, election rally, a man can live without food or sleep. He can live when he's thirsty and hungry, but when he is insulted, he cannot live. We will have to take revenge for the insult. And decades of economic growth and urbanization have mobilized an enormous desire for improvement across India, becoming a little wealthy, a little more educated, more modern. For the vast majority, as we know, these changes are slow and hard won. But there are smaller experiences of freedom and enjoyment available from social media, movies, fashion, consumer objects, and indeed the internet uh, uh, to smaller freedoms offered by political rallies, meetings, informal activism. Among millions of young and underemployed people, it's that passing of time, the capacity to enjoy it, enjoy uh, in, in, in Hindi and other Indian languages that often counts as freedom. And that's different from an earlier generation of political activism where politics was couched in language of attachment or self-sacrifice. Today, it seems that political life promises another experience of freedom, that the freedom to enjoy, to be given permission by political leaders to command the street, to attack, punish the enemies of the people and traitors of the nation, to the nation. So it's with that in mind, and this is my last sentence, a few sentences, that I uh, think about what are the implications of all this for how we experience uh, also the encroachment on political and academic freedom that many people in India feel, and even people who work on Indian uh, uh, on the on Indian society abroad. Now we all know that um, many kinds of trolling are endemic in, in in social media spaces, and Hindu nationalism, other others considering themselves Indian patriots, have created an atmosphere of permanent excitement and permanent anger where activists engage in sort of competitive sports of hurling of slurs, threats, and expletives at, at writers, tweeters, academics, and many others. In some cases, such as the campaign against a conference that was called Dismantling Hindutva that was held in September online this year, there was 1 million emails that were sent to university administrators in the US warning them of consequences, never defined if their institution supported this conference. And in those cases, that may be a clear structure and command to this form of harassment. However, in most cases, like it is with lots on the street, I would say, in much of India, um, this is not so. And most trolls are doing this as a pastime, as a mischievous scheme to disrupt and destroy a bit, a bit like the malware and the viruses going around on our networks. I've lived with this for decades, but for me, there's a clear threshold, the threats to my own person or my own or my family's safety. These are not uncommon, un unfortunately, but they are illegal in most jurisdictions. And I always tell anyone to promptly re report such activities to campus security because it's actually uh, breaking the law. As for the rest, or I can say is ignore the noise. Thank you. Great. So um, as I was saying, uh, we, uh, are keen to have participation from our uh, small but select in-person audience, but also from those of you who are listening uh, to the talk. So I'll keep my uh, remarks uh, very brief. Um, it's, uh, yeah, uh, really, as I said, a very fun, it's a fantastic talk, which gives us a lot to think about. I'm very keen to read it. 
Um, my sort of first uh, thought or question was to push you about something which you've written very eloquently about, which is uh, in relation to democracy. So you talked a lot about popular sovereignty, but were careful not to um, link it directly to democracy. And I wanted to uh, perhaps push you a little bit and, and say about um, and ask you about what you think is the relationship between uh, violence and uh, democracy and is the claim uh, that this foundational violence that was there at the historical origins of India's nation state then meant that there's something as it were baked into uh, its democracy but that that uh, is not something that's just historically particular to India, but is of general interest to those of us who um, are looking uh, to India um, uh, to tell us about what democracy has in store. So in a Tocquevillian vein, if we, um, if we think about India today, as, as he did, um, of America um, earlier, as telling us about uh, the kinds of, if you like, antinomies and challenges that democracy has to bring, and uh, India as, if you like, an exemplary case that shows that. Is that the sort of case you're making? Is that the sort of scope of the argument? Or do you wish to uh, limit um, uh, yourself to popular sovereignty? On which uh, the sort of small caveat would, with regard to Raj, would be that that's, of course, about rule, but not necessarily popular rule. And it's a term, of course, associated with the British Raj uh, and so on. Um, a second question in uh, relation to violence, but also in relation to the Constitution, which is a little bit, as you know, my own um, area of interest. Um, and in relation to the protests, the, um, uh, the citizenship protests uh, against the CAA that um, we saw and that inspired um, uh, uh, many um, in 2020. And I think you said at the start that in some ways they are invoking constitutional values. So there is a sense in which we can talk about liberal constitutionalism as uh, as having a uh, social reality in India today um, in the practices of uh, the excluded, the marginalized, or in a sense, um, these protests being an example of, if you like, bottom-up constitutionalism. But then you also sort of stepped back from that and said that, well, uh, perhaps in many cases, those are still uh, demands made on uh, behalf of, if you like, particular uh, groups rather than a uh, universal um, citizen. Um, I again wanted to push you, and I could be wrong, so please do feel free to correct me in your response, but um, uh, the two are not, of course, mutually exclusive, as your own work shows, and, and in many case, cases, the uh, demands may be made, for instance, on account of uh, Muslim um, um, citizens uh, who face a threat from uh, these amendments, uh, but the demand is being made on the on behalf of a universal value of citizenship, if you like. So, is there, if you like, a, a contradiction between the group uh, uh, and particular and the universal um, in in that sense? Um, I'll close with my final thing, which is about violence, and I think what was very um, um, uh, I think thought provoking about your talk is that you tell us to look at routine and everyday forms of violence and not just these spectacular incidents of violence. And you also pointed towards the need to look at things like riot statistics more carefully. Um, as telling us about uh, the changing, something about the changing nature of uh, violence, um, if you like, uh, in contemporary India. Um, at the same time as saying that uh, that is perhaps not, uh, if you like, all of the story. So my question, and I'm, I'm being long-winded here, so I'll stop uh, quickly, is um, yes, absolutely, and uh, we need to take uh, the routine um, uh, and um, the um, not routine forms of violence very seriously in any discussion um, of uh, democracy in India. Um, at the same time, it is, of course, not the only truth about democracy or the most fundamental truth about democracy in India. And perhaps uh, sometimes the compelling nature of violence, and this is a 
critique made of Foucault's work, but it, it's a critique applicable to a lot of those uh, who focus on violence is uh, that uh, it captures our attention in ways uh, which over uh, or which exclude the significance or the, uh, the existence of other elements to uh, the experience of democracy. So I'll stop there. Yes, please. Yeah. Uh, doing little musical chairs here. Uh, so thank you very much, Rutana. The, these are all great questions, and, and I mean, just to begin with the, with the la last one. Um, no, this is not a full story. It's not, but I think it's a story that we need to to look at. In uh, and I was when I started to drill down in these uh, uh, statistics, I was, I knew that it wasn't, there was more than communal violence to look at, because this is something everybody knows from experience, people who spent significant amounts of time in, in India, um, that there was more to it, but just the, the sheer scale of it was quite astonishing to me, uh, and, and begs a, a kind of social science question, is what, what is going on? How do we explain this? Uh, and how come that it's been, been missed out in so much work? Um, and this is going on, right? I think it, it points to also a larger sort of uh, question of, of the, the, the whole law and order and policing uh, uh, dimension of Indian society is completely understudied, completely understudied. It's been left to legal scholars, mainly very few social scientists have studied. It's not easy to do, I should say, because these are not the most forthcoming informants you can have in the world, policemen that is. But so, so it's not a full story. There's a lot more to say, uh, but but violence is exactly designed to capture the attention, right? It's a dominant, it's a strategy of domination or it's a strategy of interruption, right? Where you capture the attention and you already pre-shape an argument. If you have shown ability to stage some kind of event or violent action, then the calculus is that something, uh, and maybe not even always a calculus because it can be done in many ways, but is that this will have repercussions for a long time. And I, I find one of the things I find striking is people's uh, narrations of these things. They will say, oh, there was a disturbance here, or this is where this, this fellow uh, was, you know, uh, killed or whatever. They, these, these are history, people know them, right? They know them more about communal riots, but they also know them about other things. So there is, there is a kind of, you know, local everyday histories of violence, I think, uh, uh, that, that, that shape the way politics is transacted in ways that it is, it is designed to be this kind of almost like a meta language of politics is where it's like a condensation of, of a conflict, right? It, uh, and that's what it's designed to do. And that's why it's used. That's why it's so effective. That's why it's irresistible to most um, to most um, political operators. And the, the violence here is not necessarily one that's done is also the threat of it that can last years after one event or one show of a of a gun or whatever can, can do this. this the 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 first point about violent popular sovereignty and democracy see so my i yeah i deliberately uh, uh talk about popular sovereignty because one i think it's an understudied and underused and underexplored concept and i think it has a rich uh, life not always a life where it is articulated as, it's not as if people walk around in America or India and say, I love popular sovereignty, right? That's not the form, it's not the phenomenal experience of it. It's not the, the how it appears in the world, but it appears as a sentiment, right? As a very strong sentiment. And I think uh, I, I toy with the title for at least, maybe this, I'm gonna write a different version of this book for, for US market uh, and, and toy with the title of, of uh, uh, sovereign sentiments, because I think it is the emotional force of this that actually is really interesting and in how deep it is and how consequential it is. Um, uh, that, that can happen in a democracy, but it's, it, it doesn't have to be, right? Uh, uh, the, those two things are not necessarily, um, uh, uh, I mean, it, it, we know that democracies create all kinds of, of, of conditions for this to thrive. This is, India is the prime example of that. But, but, uh, and, but also the US, as we see at the moment, or other places in the world. But I think the popular sovereignty is also invoked and mobilized in, in situations where there's perhaps less than fully evolved democracies as we see, right? Um, so it is a, it, it, it's just a, a, a form of, uh, it's a form of political subjectivity, you might say, or projection or horizon of thinking within which you imagine your own political 
life uh, that I think needs to be studied. Now. I think there's a strong link between popular sovereignty and violence stronger than there is between democracy and violence. So, so ultimately, of course, this is a conversation about what Indian democracy has come to and what it, what it does enable, but it's not all there is to say about it's by, this book is not about Indian democracy as such, but it's about a very important element in it. And the last thing I just want to say is that um, when I say that these, uh, the constitution is invoked, um, I, I, I think it's striking that, that the, the constitution has um, um, a life that is only now, it's as if the constitution is being discovered in a strange way. In, in, in political life, in, in academic writing, you'd be hard pressed to find a few people like uh, 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 Granville Austin and a few other people writing about the constitution in the 60s and 70s uh, and some legal scholars. But from the 1980s, 90s onwards, the constitution becomes an object of interest for historians, for social scientists and so on and so forth, but not very much, right? And it's only as far as I know, and I may well stand corrected here, but as far as I know, even in the even when emergency came to halt, even with the first janitor cabinet and all that, there was all the civil liberties stuff going on. But I don't know of, I never read anything about where the constitution was kind of held up. And I come at this also from having lived and worked in South Africa, where after the end of apartheid, the constitution became a sort of rallying point they, they produced millions of copies of a pocket-sized constitution you could carry in your pocket and people would take it out and they would take it out in political rallies and read from it, right? In meetings and there would be, there would be pre before we start this meeting, we'd like to read something from the constitution. So, you know, this is a, I mean, an astonishing thing, but, you know, the same could easily have happened uh, in India. It happened in 2020. People would be in these rallies and they would read the preamble and so on. They would read some of the, the articles, right? So my question is, why, why then? Why not before? Why not the last 20 years? What's going on? Is it because the constitution is under threat? I don't know, but that's, that's one part of it. And, and I think, I, I don't think we have to pass a purity test of, of invocation of the constitution if people support the constitution for whatever, you know, and, and the language of the law as a promise, as a horizon, as is very much the case with both Muslims and Dalits and, and also ST communities and so on, that promise a certain protection. I think that's great. We don't have to, but I'm just saying that it doesn't mean that you may live your community life in accordance with constitutional principles, right? And you shouldn't. I mean, that, that's nobody asked for that, right? So. No, I think, you, I mean, all what you're saying is actually correct I mean, it's happening right um uh, and and i like your point that popular sovereignty is maybe too um i mean the, the ways in which we can think about it as a uh, uh as a idea that the majority should rule that we have legitimacy because of our standing as the real people and so on and and so and that can um and that's exactly what friend especially like if you think of the, the linguistic movements, that was the, the argument they harnessed, right? That sentiment they harnessed very strongly. This is about numbers, it's about our land and so on, and we are the majority and so on. And, and they tried to, 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 to make that argument in a sort of classic popular sovereignty domain of uh, form. Whereas I think you're right with the vigilante groups or even some of these, I mean, it's, it's, it's of course more proliferating right now, but the, we go back and, uh, decades and there has been sort of semi-private armies or whatever but uh, i don't think uh, at times maybe the, the 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 justification for some of that violence has been in terms of protecting the larger nation a larger uh, uh, community but very often it's also been about you know settling scores or, or i am this community or i'm working for this big man whatever um and and, and we have to teach them a lesson and uh, and so on so uh, you're right that not all that violence is encompassed within a sort of framework of saying this is what we're doing, right? But I think it's interesting that what has happened in the last um, six, seven years under uh, under BJP is, of course, on one hand, an outsourcing of a lot of this violence, right? So most of the, the violence that actually takes place against minorities is not done. There's no state actor except Yogi sometimes, uh, but 
in the rest of India, it's done by all these other agents, completely maybe affiliated with the BJP, maybe not often, yes, but not directly, right? But they still try, I think, to more so than has ever been the case. And that, that's maybe their innovation is that they, they try to harness, right? I mean, there's a whole big debate about what happens to caste violence and, and forms of, of you know, um, um, pushback against Dalits and lower caste communities under the ages or under the protection, as it were, of the Hindu Rashtra, right? That now we do it in, in the name of this, which means you you gotta you gotta just tell do what we, we tell you, right? Um, so so I, I think you're right that, that not all of this kind of wild or dispersed forms of of desires of revenge or violence or, or use that as a kind of not everything that shows up in the police statistics, right? A lot of that might well be this kind of stuff that you talk about, right? It might it is. There's no question about it. And at times it gets harnessed and formulated within this. And I do think that that's certainly the politics of what, what the BJP is trying to do is to be in a sense, to give a direction to some of this, right? To give a cover, it's like, almost like an umbrella under which you can, you can, uh, you, you can act, right? It, it's like a script um, that you can adopt. You may have done it anyway, but here's a script, right? Well, how about that? And, and that script in itself is sort of also mobilizing that. So, so it's complicated, but I like the way you put it. It's, it's complicated, and I, I don't think it's a simple, um, it's a simple question. But I do think it's a there's a vast area of of uh, you know what how people perpetrate these kinds of violence, how they justify it to themselves, how they uh, how this connects with these wider sort of discursive forms that people can draw on at various times, right? And that's in flux. Um, but I think it's it's one of the, these things we should look at. Okay, oh. I've been instructed to uh, so, so shop, shop to, me up. No, no, <laughs> uh, to be the timekeeper, which is not always the uh, happiest of uh, roles. But we also uh, have uh, audience questions. So if you don't mind, uh, and I can, if I could read out yeah. a few questions from our virtual audience, and then we can come back to the audience in the room if, if they're burning questions. So if I may, I might take three questions at a time, and then uh, because we have about 10 minutes or so, and then you can choose yeah. um, uh, how to respond to those. So the first was from Vishal Bora, who is interested to hear more about the threats of violence made uh, regarding dismantling global Hindutva and if the, yeah, there were uh, evidence and examples of this. Uh, the second question is from Faraz Khan, who says, um, isn't violent demagoguery and um, violent demagoguery and angry mobs a common feature of any low and middle income country instead of being specific to India? And sometimes even in richer countries uh, with ethnic and racial divides and if our right populist leadership, if it's USA, Trump, Turkey, Erdogan, et cetera, aren't we seeing a common phenomenon here? The third uh, question is from uh, Farah Shah. And um, I think uh, she wanted to know more about the uh, limitations regarding freedom of uh, speech and um, expression um, and um, yeah and how um, and how it's possible to categorize people as traitors or instigators but uh, I think you did say something in relation to that in your talk but over okay. to you okay yeah thank you yeah, so let me uh, uh, just let me answer the second question, which is, in a sense, uh, a, a straightforward question. This is not unique to India, no. Uh, does it exist in other uh, countries? Yes, I live in one of them, known as the United States, uh, where I think we have vigilantes that are far more dangerous than uh, anything you see in India. They have a lot more guns, and uh, they have there is a military culture that pervades that society, and I think. Um, I think one of the things that happened with the Trump era was that all of that became visible uh, uh, in a way that it's been there for a very long time. It's become weaponized, it's become given a political. It's a little bit what Sabir and I were just discussing. There's a, there's a narrative that gives it form because all these militias and all these sentiments and, and all these, you know, uh, pushing back against uh, 
America becoming a, a, a black and brown society and so on, right? Instead of a white society and all that, that all those have been there for a long time, but this has given a narrative and a narrative arc and focus to some of this. So yes, there's, there's nothing um, uh, uh, unique in that sense. I think every country has its own um, articulation of this, but I think the, the, the arguments being made, I mean, the popular sovereignty argument is very strong in the US, it's extremely strong, right? We are the people, we are the patriots, and, and these people have stolen the election or they are whatever. And, and uh, it's also interesting, I mean, it has deep roots in, in the US and in other forms. You know, one of the big debates about popular sovereignty in the US and a classic debate is between uh, Abraham Lincoln and some of these Southern, uh, 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 Southern politicians, right? Who are saying we are defending the state's rights against the union and we are defending popular sovereignty and including slavery, right? Our right to own slaves. So, so there's a, a lot going on there. Uh, the first thing about dismantling Hindutva, uh, yeah, I mean there were there were tons of, of threats made against uh, people, the, the organizing committee. The, the threats were pretty much the same as are always made. Some of them are now because of social media technologies and other things, you know, you locate people. We are all very easy to locate where people can find your address. I have also been been e e receiving threatening emails uh, that say, we know where you live, we are coming to visit you and so on and so forth. And that's when you call campus security and uh, and so on. And, I, I, uh, and there are people who have been trolled much more viciously. There's a trolling against women, which is particularly vicious. Um, and uh, there's a trolling against and South Asian women, uh, especially. Um, uh, actually, if you look like me, you'll probably like you, you'll get trolled, but not to the same degree of cruelty. Um, so, so, so all of these misogynist uh, racial uh, dynamics go into this kind of thing. And, and so, so the, the conference was sort of uh, hanging a little bit in the balance at some point. Um, but people pulled together and, and fortunately, uh, although institutions were encouraged to dissociate themselves, it didn't happen. So we were able to get support from most of the institutions and that's important. And I think that's also what the battle is about, especially public institutions with not a lot of money uh, are prone to give in to this, to cave in to, cave in to public cave pressure. To and, and one of the things they did was to use something called the Hindu America Foundation they had on their website a template for a letter that you could download and then write, my son, my daughter goes to such and such school or was or wants to go, whatever, and I will never send my kids to this school because you support your anti-Hindu or whatever. And they sent something like half a million of these letters. We don't know how many were, were, were sent. And they were all bogus. And this is fundamentally bogus, right? But it, it, for if you are an unsuspecting dean or admissions officer or whatever, and you get all this in your mailbox, it's like, Oh, so our job is to, in a sense, educate our colleagues to say, this is these are the people they run a conservative campaign. You gotta, you gotta be right. Um, naive about it. Not naive about it, but also not not be too afraid of it. To Correct. be robust about it, and and uh, I mean, this is the reality we live in, right? And and it's uh, people are attuned to this when it comes to threats within your own country, but when it comes from a country you may not know, then it's a different thing, right? So. Um, I mean, my line on this is that, that uh, I don't think we as academics, uh, I use a kind of uh, standard American response is that I don't think we should be dictated by the agents of a foreign government, right? Uh, that seems to work really well. Uh, so um, that's a good, I think it's a good line to have um, against these people. Uh, the, what was the third question that was about? Um, it was about academic. Uh, freedom and freedom uh, of speech, but I think it's, I think you address that. Um, just yeah. very uh, uh, quickly, I'll, I'll conclude with, I mean, I think there were a couple of questions and I'll just sort of say them very quickly. That is one from Shivam Kataria is, can we ascribe this increasing violence to the colonial paranoia of public violence uh, dating back to the 1857 mutiny? And uh, the uh, next question from Ishita Saxena is, is it fair to categorize Ambedkar right constitutionalism in the same way as constitutional patriotism? Uh, the Indian constitution was imagined and drafted as a transformative document, uh, and therefore uh, uh, 
adherence to a document that's forward looking um, book the same way as a document considered um, as stuck in time. Um, but I'll, I'll stop with that. Yeah, no, I, I like that question. I, I think. Was Ambedkar a patriot? Uh, was, is it I think so. I think so. <laughs> is it fair to categorize Ambedkarite constitutionalism in the same, um, if you like, um, box uh, as constitutional patriotism? I think that's. And she so, said so, so, that maybe she didn't hear it correctly. So if you could clarify. No, so that, so, so, so that, that term, is. yeah. So that term has been used. I mean, it was sort of uh, coined by Habermas and others, you know, and it's it's a. It's, a, it's essentially an argument against popular nationalism. If you sit and think about the world in Germany, then thinking about popular sovereignty, uh, you know, is complicated, right? There's a complicated history, let's say, of, of the invocation of, of the nation and all that. And Habermas's idea is that a political community should come together, not because of their fealty and their loyalty to the nation, but to that constitution that constitutes their, that describes their political community. That's what the notion of, uh, uh, of constitutional patriotism is. I actually think Ambedkar would have agreed with that. Uh, he, but we also know that Ambedkar was frustrated by many things in terms of what was possible, what was possible to encode in law. And he resigned as a law minister after some years, right? So he, he believed in, in the reform, the, the power of law in terms of reform, but he also, but he was frustrated. He, in the end, he said, these people, you know, Hindu society cannot be easily reformed because they don't want to do it, right? Um, so, so there's more to it, but I do think that he he would have been in agreement uh, with this formulation that instead of, of of having a political community based on history and historical destiny, it's it's based on as it were the invention, which is essentially the American model, right? Yeah. The American model: you you come together, you give yourself a constitution, you build it around. Of course, in reality, America is not that because it was built on, on racial superiority and weapons and lots of violence and all that. But the idea is that. Right? Yeah. So I want to answer the last question and then we so, close. So that was the, the last. So, so yeah, she, I think um, my interpretation of uh, that uh, last point that uh, was made, I think, by Sheeta Saxena is that even so, um, and if we if we think of this as being a version of constitutional patriotism, isn't there a difference between transformative constitutionalism, which is what we have with Ambedkar or yep, looking at yep. a constitution oh, then, uh, as a forward looking document, yeah. as distinct from a constitution that is uh, yeah, enshrined, entrenched, and is uh, yeah, something US, that you are the US, the US model. Yeah. So uh, no, she the, would and I would push you further. No, the oh, U.S. Constitution has uh, become a weapon of the right. There is no question about yeah. it, right? And it's become a, 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 a weapon of the of the literalist on the Supreme Court and all that. We know that, right? Yeah. There, there is no doubt about that, and and because it's a very old document. But I, uh, the idea of a constitutional patriotism doesn't say anything about the age of the of the Constitution, right? I mean, I'm thinking of my South African friends with their pocket-sized Constitution. Uh, invoking it at every political meeting, that's constitutional patriotism in a country that badly needed something new because what is the history of South Africa if not a history of violence, right? And, and, uh, and, and oppression of the worst kind. So of course you need that. So I, I'm, yeah, I think the concept is interesting. Yeah. Um, and I think maybe it's because patriotism has a, has a bad name, you know, for all yeah. kinds of reasons. But I think the meaning of it is, is where from where do you derive the loyalty yeah. to the community, right? Yeah. That's the idea. Right? But there was one more thing. Uh, I don't think so. Um, and I don't think so. I think we've covered everything. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank I'm, you I'm sorry. so much for, uh, yeah, no, you were saying, <laughs> um, did, did I? Yeah. No, there was one, one more. I forget what that first uh, short question was, but anyway, it's okay. Um, no, I think uh, you've uh, done justice okay. to questions okay. as far was pos okay. as far as was possible within the constraints of the time yeah. that yeah, uh, sure. uh, that you've had. So thank you so much. It's thank hard you. to uh, address a lot of questions um, after a long talk. So uh, thank you for that. And. Uh, it's been, yeah, it's been a great session. It's very, f it's not very often that we get a scholar who combines attention to uh, detail and to uh, particularity with 
uh, seeking uh, to come up with a general uh, uh, vision um, and uh, there are very few in fact who would go beyond their own methodological niche or regional niche to talking uh, the, um, in the terms of uh, political uh, theory of sovereignty and democracy more generally. So thank you very much for that. And it's over to Ed now for closing remarks. Uh... Rachna, thank you very much. Um, Thomas, thank you very much for a, a thought provoking and as Sabir said, hair oil question. Uh, kind of, kind of, me, yes, now, I, I'm trying to work out what Sabir meant by that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and you don't need hair to experience that, I, I, I suppose. It's optional. It's optional. Yeah. Anyway, Thomas, thank you so much for delivering the South Asia Institute annual lecture. Uh, it's been a pleasure. Uh, and a challenging set of conversations, I think, that I hope will continue over dinner later on. So thank you very much, and please join um, me in expressing thanks to Thomas with a round of applause. And finally, I, I thank the audience who've been very patient with us uh, in our hybrid attempts um, at hosting this lecture online. Thank you very much for your patience and I hope you've been provoked and challenged by the experience. And I hope to see you again next year. Bye. <laughs>